And thanks to all of you for uh, coming. You know, the crazy thing about windows is that um, the first thing we start to do is change the way that they perform. Uh, it's usually not quite as drastic as this particular slide here. Uh, this house is right down the street from me in Brattleboro. And, you know, not surprisingly, they're quite private people. I have no idea why they boarded up these two windows, but uh, sort of represents an extreme. But we are going to focus on the performance of windows, um, either by replacing them or, or modifying them with an attachment. You know, this I call this slide my uh, window doily slide. Um, but I, I like it because we are focusing on performance, but what we have to remember is that aesthetics are really, really important to the people that uh, are, are trying to modify the performance of their windows. And the other thing I like about this is that aesthetics is truly in the eye of the beholder. So uh, you'll see later on we look at uh, qualities to assess. We're going to skip aesthetics because it's really not up to us to evaluate that. It's up to the consumer. So when we talk about what to do about windows, since we you know, almost immediately start changing the way that they work, we really have two challenges. And, and one is, what are all the options we can do to change the way the windows work? And then what are all the attributes that we can uh, take a look at uh, in terms of changing their performance? And the first challenge is that I think on this slide there's, I think, 17 different things you can do to a window. Uh, we have on the left the interior uh, attachments or uh, uh, coverings, treatments. And then we have a column of all the exterior uh, attachments. And then on the right, you can replace the full unit of the window. You can do an insert window to replace the window. You can just replace the sashes. Or you can take the existing window and repair and upgrade it. Now, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is focused on the two left-hand columns because um, there's a lot of great information on the performance of replacement windows. And the best resource, absolutely hands down, is uh, efficientwindows.org, which is the Efficient Windows Collaborative website, where you can compare existing uh, uh, replacement windows, but also new windows. So um, we'll come back to look again at this resource, but um, there are a lot of different things we can do to change the way the windows work. And the second challenge is that there's all kinds of attributes that people consider, or sort of performance issues. And you can see the three columns here. People may want to modify the way that the window works from a thermal performance perspective. They may want to change the way it works visually. You know, a big issue is daylighting and glare. And these needs can change from room to room in the house. Um, issues of utility, you know, how easy is it, is it to operate uh, the window or the window attachment? Uh, how durable is the attachment or the window going to be? And the list goes on. You know, how does the window or the attachment perform from an economic perspective? And then other issues such as how easy is it to install? Uh, what's its effect on acoustics um, and security? You know, that can be a primary driver for some folks in terms of changing the way their windows work. So when we take a look at how people make decisions about adjusting their windows, it, it immediately gets pretty complicated. The third challenge really is that uh, we have a great system for fairly and quantitatively comparing how windows perform. The National Fenestration Rating Council um, has done a lot of work over the years to, using standardized tests, uh, evaluate how windows work. They have very exacting rules about how the testing occurs. And so what do we do with attachments? Um, it's kind of interesting that the only window retrofit or attachment other than a replacement window that has a NFRC label today is an applied film. And the reason that's interesting is because once you put the applied film on the window, it pretty much acts just like a window. So it's, it's not hard to take the tests and the criteria that are used by the NFRC for windows and apply it to an attachment like a film. But what about something like an exterior storm? You know, how are we going to compare? What's the base case of the wind go, window going to be? What about a shade? Um, I can adjust that. Well, do I do the standardized test with the shade up, the shade down? partially deployed, um, issues of adjustability come in. So 
the folks who represent the attachment industry would really like for the NFRC to help them develop ways of evaluating the performance of the attachments that are just the same as the way that windows are evaluated. But it's not as easy because applying the same test to something that's adjustable or that can perform differently with a different type of base case window, it, it's really challenging. Um, and you can see that uh, other attachments are being worked on by the NFRC, uh, the National Fenestration Rating Council's attachment subgroup. Um, but it's tough going because it's, uh, there, there's a, it's a lot more difficult to apply the same rules to, uh, to the variety of attachments that we have. And because of this difficulty of rationally and fairly comparing uh, attachments to each other and then attachments to window replacement, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is one of five national labs, LBNL has the specialty of uh, daylighting and, and glazing. They approached Building Green, the company that I work for, and said, could you work with us on the challenges of fairly comparing and even just getting information out to the, to the building professionals and the general public about how to select different types of window attachments. And in this project over the last 18 months, we've had four different tasks. The first was to perform an, uh, to uh, establish an uh, advisory committee. And it was going to be a mix of private industry representatives, uh, window experts, and also research staff. Uh, they wanted us to do a literature review. You know, what, what does the literature tell us about the research that's been done on uh, window attachments? And then we were trying to do some field testing where we were hoping to use infrared imaging to establish sort of compelling comparative information of how one attachment performs to the other. And then finally, the fourth task was to develop guidance tools. Um, take all the information we had gathered, and especially working with the advisory committee, and turn that into tools that uh, both building professionals and the general public could use. On the advisory committee, we have a really you know, powerful group. We have uh, four different industry representatives. Uh, John Gant from Glenraven uh, represents awnings. Mike Chenyon from Hunter Douglas. Uh, they, Hunter Douglas produces a variety of different interior uh, shades, but uh, specialty in cellular shades, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, there's been a lot of progress made on applied films uh, to the interior and sometimes to the exterior of the window. And then Andrew Caldwell with Pfeiffer uh, mainly focused on solar screens. And then on the right-hand side is a lot of industry experts. Uh, Tom Culp with Birchpoint Consulting on storm windows. Um, and you can see the rest of the list there. A, a very strong group that um, meets on a regular basis to address the issues of the project. So we're going to take a, a look at each of those four tasks and see what we've learned about uh, different types of retrofitting windows. Uh, the first thing we learned from the literature review was that we're really in the early, early stages. When we look at how different uh, parts of the building envelope perform, what we're really looking for is to try to have the laboratory testing, the field testing, and modeling converge. You know, because the more that they start to, uh, to integrate and look similar, that means we're doing a pretty good job of understanding exactly how that portion of the building envelope works. And what we learned from the literature review is that we're, we're really in the early stages. It's, it's early in the game to be looking at how the laboratory testing, the field testing, and the modeling are lining up four different types of window attachments. Now, there is a new beta version of Windows 7. Windows 7 is a Lawrence Berkeley National Lab modeling program to which they are constantly adding new attachments which means that you can go and apply the modeling to an increasing number of attachments to compare how they perform. So I encourage you to take a look at Windows 7, the new beta. The other thing is that when you go from country to country and when you look at the variety of uh, uh, work that's going on, there's different types of test methods. There's different base cases. Um, there's a lot of different options, and it's pretty much a jungle. There, there's not a lot of correlation yet in terms of the research mosaic, and particularly with the methods. Now, having said that, one of the good pieces of, of news is that a lot of non-North American uh, research that's been done on window attachments uses a modeling program called ESPR. 
And that's a different program than we use here in the United States for whole house performance assessments, assessments which is Energy Plus. And the research that's been done to date shows pretty good alignment of how Energy Plus treats window attachments and window replacement and ESPR. So that's, that's good news. When we come to terminology and classification, um, it's also a jungle out there. And there's two sort of jungles. One is that the science community hasn't really landed on the right terms. You know, you may have found when you tuned into this webinar, well, which term do we use? Window retrofits, window attachments, window coverings. Um, you, know, you know, those terms can have different meanings or very similar meanings to both the scientific community and the general public. We sort of settled, settled frankly, on the term attachments, uh, not because we were attached to it, but because um, that's the term that the NFRC had chosen to use. So nailing down the terminology uh, for both attachments and their performance is challenging. And then when you take a look at websites in particular and look at the quality of the manufacturer posted information, it's pretty much all over the map. There are some manufacturers that have pretty robust information on the performance of their uh, products on the web. There are some others that are, uh, are, are, are frankly uh, pretty creative. And one of the last topics that came up in the lit literature review is that there is some indication that if you have a really high performance window and you mate that with a really high performance attachment, uh, maybe you're going to get results that are negatively synergistic. And, and we'll talk a bit about that a little bit later. The, the second task we did after the literature search was to engage in field testing. And again, what we were trying to do was we thought, well, could we use infrared images that would reveal the performance difference of various window options or window retrofit options in a compelling way? Um, because infrared images, particularly color, uh, color renderings, can really convey a lot of information. So we wanted to look into that. We, we wanted to add to the infrared uh, results, uh, particularly heat flux sensors and thermocouples, the heat flux sensors measuring the amount of energy coming through uh, the window or the attachment, and then the thermocouple, of course, uh, measuring temperatures. So, and also take digital images um, to sort of put the infrared images and the other data into a, a context. And since no one has ever really done this before, we were trying to develop a protocol or some standardized test so that others could use these set of rules to try to duplicate results or test the results that we got. And one of the key things here is that the wintertime testing of windows or window attachments is going to be very different than the summertime testing because of the, the, the main aspects of performance are quite different from wintertime to summertime. We'll talk about that a little bit too. Well, the first thing to do about field testing is, well, where are we going to do all this testing? And um, it's field testing. We wanted to do it in a real building. And we tried a number of different um, uh, situations. And much to my wife's delight, we decided to select our own house. And so this image here is a drawing of the front of our house. And you can see that the top is facing east. And we have a living room that has kind of kitty corner windows at the top. And then there's a, a former porch on the left that was turned into an office. And what's important about this is that I think I'll go to the next slide to show you. Uh, this corner window on the right faces southeast. And we've already replaced all the windows in the house, the original single pane double hung sashes, which are 100 years old, with sash replacements that are double pane low E. But one window, this kitty corner one on the left-hand side that faces the office, we didn't bother to replace because it's uh, an interior window. So the good news is we had one set of single-pane sashes still in the house that we could use when we were changing the base case test window from, say, the double-pane low-E sash to the original single-pane clear glass. And you can see that in the left-hand picture, my daughter has decided that she's some sort of window attachment. But this is, you know, this is the setup that we're going to use. And uh, I'm going to note that this is for the wintertime testing. Here's the kitty corner west, uh, kitty corner uh, uh, living room window that faces southeast and from both the interior and the exterior. 
And um, it's a pretty typical double hung window. It's about 27 inches by 60 inches uh, in terms of the opening. Uh, when you look at it from the outside, there's two things that are important. It's kind of sheltered by a cedar tree on the left there, but it doesn't interfere um, with the actual window. And the windows on the first floor, because this is a concrete block home, are quite inset. And so that means we're going to have less uh, variation with wind because the window is a little bit more protected. Of course, the wintertime testing is going to occur uh, when it's nice and cold out. And uh, when we set up to do the testing the first time, the first couple of days, uh, we uh, conveniently arranged for my family to go visit relatives so, because all of the wintertime testing is going to take place at night. We don't want any interference from solar gain. Um, so here in this picture I wanted to show you, uh, Rob Spring is a field infrared thermographer with about 30 years experience. He's uh, actually trying to calibrate uh, one of the infrared cameras with that blue box piece of equipment there. Uh, Howdy Gowdy is the lead lab infrared thermographer from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And then Charlie uh, Churchill on the right is the project manager from LBNL, all with you know, dozens of years experience with window performance and window physics. Um, but what was interesting about this is that Howdy's got a lot of experience on lab testing with infrared and Rob with field testing. So they spent a lot of time sort of lining up to make sure we were doing things correctly so that we would get better correlation between the field and the lab results. And I wanted to show you this picture because we're looking into the, uh, to the living room on the left. But that, this, the living room communicates with the dining room. And we can seal off both these rooms and sort of treat it as a separate part of the house. And that's important because we want to test the air tightness of the window attachments. And so we installed a fan in a dining room window that we can use to depressurize just this part of the house. And you'll notice that the infrared camera on the tripod, it's not pointing directly at the window. It's set off at an angle. And the reason for that is that um, if you're shooting at a window you're, and you're shooting directly into it, like I'm looking directly to, into the camera at you, um, you'll get feedback because the window reflects. So you always want to take the infrared image at a slight angle. Then what becomes important because of the reflective properties of the window or the attachment is what does the window see? Because it has to be a perfectly sort of neutral background because the way the camera works is off of emissivity and we want the emissivity of the background to be steady and sort of neutral so that we don't get any confounding effects by what the camera sees. For instance, um, we want, for part of the testing, one of us was sitting on that couch. We got up to move. We left a thermal residue on that couch, and that uh, thermal shadow from the person sitting there showed up on our image. So we're really looking for the background not to interfere with the results of the infrared testing. And so for some of the testing, particularly low E coatings to the interior, we, we set up a background that we could put up uh, very neutral, uh, standard emissivity of about 0.9, and also uh, temperature neutral. So we wouldn't have confounding effects. OK, so this is the first slide that shows some results. And essentially on the left is a picture of the window, the test window on the southeast corner. You can see it's dark out. We're testing. We started testing probably about 8 PM in the evening. And the thermocouples and the heat flux sensors are right there on the window. And you'll notice that we've shielded um, the uh, baseboard heater underneath that uh, blanket there is uh, uh, an inch of XPS insulation because the heat washing up that window could distort the results. And on the right, we have the uh, situation with a double pane low E. That's the sash replacement uh, with no attachment. But we've got the fan on in the dining room. And you can see it's exaggerating heat loss around the perimeter of the window. And this slide simply shows uh, the picture of the test window where we have replaced the double pane sashes with the original single pane. And we've added to the interior an airtight low E storm. And then the image on the right is an inf a corresponding infrared image. And you can see that uh, it, well, actually, you'll see and compare it to uh, other infrared images, it's going to have a significant impact on the performance of the window. 
Here you can see set up uh, the insulated cellular shade. And the insulated cellular shade, uh, of course, has air pockets that trap um, the air and therefore uh, uh, resist uh, heat flow. But this particular insulated cellular shade has side tracks. So it's also a bit more airtight because there's, uh, no, there's fewer ways for the air to circulate behind the window and create convective heat loss. Now, what you're going to notice, though, is when I go to this next slide, there's another setup. This is with, the, uh, 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 with a window quilt, also with magnetic uh, runners, so that this is held very tight to the window. But if you look at the temperature scale on this slide, across the top, you can see it goes from 75.9 Fahrenheit to 52.5 Fahrenheit. And the previous slide is 73 to 44. So this represents one of the initial challenges because the camera looks for the range based upon the temperature extremes in the photo. And so under slightly different conditions, since we can't test these attachments at the same time, we're going to get differing conditions. And we're not going to be able to compare these images if we're having different settings or different temperature ranges expressed in the photographs. So we're actually working out the details as we go about working towards the goal of getting standardized ways of comparing the performance of these attachments visually. Here you can see the uh, single pane no attachment. And what's interesting about the image on the right is that some research done by um, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, you need a temperature of about 57 degrees on the surface of that window 57 or above, and that's Fahrenheit, for there really to be comfort if you're located fairly close to that window. And you can see even with the, uh, in this case with the single pane and no attachment, uh, that crosshairs is showing 52.4 degrees at the meeting rail of the two sashes, which it's wood. But in the field of the window, which is kind of purplish, you know, those temperatures are down into the 40s. So in addition to changing the thermal performance of the window in terms of energy savings and cost, we're also looking to change the thermal comfort in the room. We want to be able to sit near these windows and not have them be cold in terms of a radiant effect on the uh, pe people sitting next to it. So this is the first slide where what we've done is taken the data, which is just pixels of you know, 300 dots that represent individual temperatures, and we've manipulated the data to pull all the images into the same temperature range. And now we can start to compare the thermal performance of these windows. So on the left, we have an interior low E storm over the vintage or the original single pane wood frame double hung. Then we have the uh, interior low E storm over a double low E argon sash replacement. And then here's the base case uh, on the right that, that allows us to fairly compare these different options. So that's really the goal that we're looking for. We want to have the camera set on the uh, correct settings for all three, but then we want to manipulate the data to make the temperature range the same so that these pictures make sense. In this slide, what you can see on the, on the left, uh, we have a, uh, an exterior clear storm but we've also depre the DP underneath that slide means we're depressurizing it. And when we depressurize, we're forcing more uh, air leakage and exaggerating the thermal performance. Uh, in the center is a low E storm over the double low E sash replacement. And whenever you get a field that looks relatively the same and it's a fairly warm uh, color, that means that we're getting pretty good performance. So can we compare head to head this low E storm, this uh, interior storm panel on the left, which has a nice heavy rubber gasket and is mounted right onto the face of the uh, window trim, can we compare it to the insulated cellular shade? Now, if you look at these, you'd say, mm, well, they both do pretty well, but it looks like the interior low E panel is doing a little better. Well, that's confounded by the fact that the insulated cellular shade is adjustable. It's top down, bottom up, so I can open up the top for indirect daylighting. Um, I can raise the shade completely if I want to let light in. Lastly, I can get out this window on the right a bit more easily. The, storm, the interior storm, which is screwed into the wall, into the uh, uh, window trim, that's going to be harder to get out of. So 
while we want to compare thermal performance, we're never going to be looking at those solely. Here again, we've forced all of these pictures into the same temperature range for comparison purposes. And as I said, we had a fan in the dining room where we wanted to see what happens when we depressurize the house, representing you know, a wind that's uh, uh, hitting the building. And you can see going left to right, the left is uh, no depressurization. Uh, the fan had two or three speeds. We measured the depressurization with the manometer. And this fan kept pretty steady depressurization at different speeds. And you can see at uh, 10 pascals, we had additional uh, heat loss. And then at 16 pascals, which is pretty much the same as like an 11 to 12 mi uh, mile per hour wind, we're definitely getting more, uh, more heat loss because of the air leakage. And so we have an awful lot of test conditions to do here. We have different base case windows with single pane and double pane. We have um, uh, different situations with the depressurization of the windows. So this was an awful lot of testing to try to tease out how these different attachments performed. Uh, this is just a quick side note. Um, this is an interior uh, screening system where one side is reflective and you face that to the inside of the room to reflect radiant heat loss. Um, and then in the summer, you spin it around and the reflective surface faces out um, to, to basically reject solar heat gain in the summer. And, uh, you know, my wife's pretty tolerant about all this testing and my constantly changing out the window attachments. But when we put this particular one in, she said, nope, that's not a go. Uh, looks a little bit look too much like a, uh, a, a science fiction movie to me. So, you know, I, we have to constantly rev remind ourselves, all these geeks testing these uh, window attachments, that the way that they look is, is important. So we're still actually processing the data from what last winter and also working on changing the test setup so that we can get more standardized results. In the meantime, we also wanted to do a second round of testing under summer conditions. Now, we've moved. We've moved from that single window in the southeast corner of the dining room, I'm sorry, the living room, to this bank of three on the south side because these windows get unobstructed solar uh, uh, view during the summer. Because in the summer, the window attachments are going to be all about rejecting solar heat gain, providing shade maintaining view. Uh, and so the other nice thing about this bank of three windows is that we could now do simultaneous testing of one base case window with two different attachments side by side. And we wouldn't have to force the infrared images to be the same because they'd all be tested at the same time. So when we do our second round of uh, wintertime testing, uh, we're likely to pick the dining room bank of windows because we can get simultaneous results. And you can see in this photo that we have some testing equipment. And this testing equipment for summertime is quite different. Since we're really concerned about how much light and, and solar energy in terms of infrared is making it through this window, what we have in this test apparatus here is a uh, photometer that's measuring light intensity coming through the window. We have a pyrometer that's measuring uh, heat energy or infrared or radiant energy coming through the window. We have a backup point um, infrared uh, sensor. That's the one that's shot at an angle to the window. And you can actually see that, that white surface is you know, the same thing. What does the infrared camera see? We have a, a shield there so it sees a steady background. Now that's what's going on on the inside in addition to the infrared camera. On the outside, what we're going to do is have another set of uh, photometer and pyrometer because we want to measure the light and the energy intensity that is being experienced outside the window to compare that to what's happening on the inside. The one additional sensor out here, you can see better in the shadow on the window sill, that's an anemometer to measure wind speed. And it turns out that the wind speeds um, for all of our testing were basically just noise. So that didn't really enter into the situation. Um, we actually even moved that anemometer out uh, because when we put it into the recessed uh, space of the windows, it didn't spin at all even when the wind was blowing. We also have, of course, temperature sensors 
and relative humidity sensors that we use to round out the data as well. So in this slide, what you're seeing is the center window is always the base case. It's single pane, clear glass. And uh, on the uh, left, we have one type of interior screen, which is uh, reflective. And on the right, we have a, a different system. And you can see that the, the sensors are in front of the right hand, and we move those. And we keep careful tracks so we can compare the data that's being recorded as we move that, uh, that apparatus from window to window. And of course, we had to do a kind of a silly taping job on this. We wanted to try to standardize the comparisons as much as possible. And since these window attachments didn't, weren't really quite designed for these windows, um, I think they were actually measured for the outside. Um, we just taped them in place, you know, not, not, of course not for the appearance, but to make sure that they had the relative uh, same sort of air tightness or fit to the window. Here on the outside, we have exterior solar screens. And what's kind of interesting is that the, uh, the screen on the right, you can see, you can see more of the window, uh, the meeting rail. That's because that has an, uh, an openness factor of about 80, whereas the solar screen on the left has an openness factor of about 90. So you, you, the way that the openness of this screening shows up is a bit different from inside to outside, but consumers can choose. You might get slightly higher performance with the openness factor of 90, but of course it cuts down on the visible light making through the window as well. Now, there's an awful lot of information packed into this slide, but on the left, we have two interior window attachments, uh, two, two interior solar screens. And then on the left, we have two exterior. And what's interesting about, and then there's data down below that shows the control information. We didn't have room for a picture, a thermal image of the control, but we do have the data down below for comparison. Now, what, what, do, what does this grouping of four tell us? Well, we know that exterior attachments should do a much better job of you know, delivering comfort to the inside or energy savings because it's stopping the solar heat gain outside. It's not trying to stop it from the inside after that energy has already passed through the window. But the differences in the thermal images are relatively modest. And so to get a better idea of just how well they're keeping heat out, we have to go and look at both the, uh, for, for heat, we have to look at the photometer ratio, which is the comparison of energy measured outside and energy measured inside, and then look at the photometer for the light intensity measured outside to the light intensity measured inside. So what we're learning here is that the infrared images that, which record the surface temperature of the, either the window or the window attachment, when we're talking about how much light energy is sort of radiating into the room, that may not show up very well in terms of the surface temperature. So um, the, the results of the summertime testing in terms of the infrared image, they're just not going to be as compelling without the accompanying data of the uh, ratio of light passing through and energy passing through. In this slide, what we're looking at is three images. The uh, image on the left is for a low E, low solar heat gain exterior storm. In the middle, we have the, always the base case. That's single pane glass, no uh, low E coatings, no coatings at all. And on the right, we have a low E exterior sor storm, high solar heat gain. And so you look at these three images and you say, wow, you know, why isn't the low solar heat gain on the left showing a much more compelling thermal image than the high solar heat gain low E storm on the right. And the reason is because that's not showing up in the surface temperatures, which is what the infrared camera is measuring. However, take a look real carefully at the sills or the interior stool. That's the window trim that's flat, like a little shelf. You can see in the middle that that's white hot, right? That's the clear glass. That's telling us that there's an awful lot of that solar uh, heat gain and, and direct solar radiation that's passing through the clear glass. And there is a significant difference at the 
bottom of the bottom sash and the stool between the right hand high solar heat gain exterior storm and the low solar heat gain exterior storm on the left. In fact, it's actually shown a little bit more clearly here. This is the same set of attachments but with a thermal image of all three in the bank of the window. And you can very clearly see white on the stool, the, the window trim on the interior in the middle, um, very you know, deep red on the sill on the right for the high solar heat gain low east storm, and then much lower yellow temperatures on the uh, window trim at the sill on the left. So once again, this, this, this shows that when we're looking at the infrared images during the summer, we're going to have to uh, look at not just the surface temperatures of the glass, we're going to have to look at other temperatures as well, and that ratio of the energy passing through as expressed by the parameter uh, ratio. Well, this is the west face of the house on the second floor. And what we did is we set up these two windows to test exterior attachments like retractable awnings, uh, retractable solar screens, and then on the right you can see that there's a fixed awning. And we did this so that as the day progressed and the sun swung to the west, we could take a look at a different set of attachments, but also we were particularly interested in the performance difference between a fixed awning and as the, so, uh, as the sun comes around and sinks lower to the west, how did that fixed awning compare in performance to an adjustable awning? The motorized awning on the left can swing all the way down um, to a 160 degree angle and completely shield uh, or, or, or uh, shade the window even when the sun is at a very low angle. And so here we have moved the test equipment to the, uh, uh, to the bedroom to the west. You can see that in the left-hand window we have the fixed awning, and, and we actually tested two different colors of awnings as well. And then on the right, uh, we have fully deployed that awning all the way down. And you can see that the, at the very bottom of the window, you can see the wavy edge of the vertical leg, leg of the uh, adjustable retractable uh, awning and it's completely covering the window. All right, so another fairly busy slide, but what I wanted to show you here is that on the left, and this is with the double pane low E sashes, we have the awning, the fixed awning. And a couple of things are important with this. You can see that compared to the control in the middle, wow, what, what great temperatures we're getting. Very cool, a little bit of yellow in the upper, and one of the reasons for the difference between the lower sash and the upper sash is the fixed awning attaches right to the window trim. And if there's heat rising up, it's actually getting sort of caught in that, the cap that the awning forms. And just below this bedroom, you know, if you look back at this photo, um, you can see that there's actually the, uh, the, uh, stain, the uh, standing seam metal roof of the kitchen addition uh, and the air temperatures that are being experienced because of that, that uh, metal roof, we were measuring temperatures of 110 degrees Fahrenheit when, it, when the air temperature everywhere else was 80 degrees. And so the capture of heat underneath this fixed awning is being exaggerated by this metal roof that's just below these windows. Uh, on the right, you can see that uh, with the double pane low E sashes, I'm getting pretty significant temperatures trapped behind that insulated cellular shade. This is actually the same data. I'm, I'm sorry I have both these in here, but what I want to do is move on to this slide. Now, this slide shows the control in the middle, which, uh, I'm sorry, it sh on the left, what we see here is the unshaded, single pane clear window. And what's interesting about this is that that single pane window on the field of the window, since that energy has, that window has no coatings on it, it's just single pane clear, the, the energy is passing pretty much through the window and we pick up some temperature rise at the meeting rail of the two sashes, down at the bottom uh, of the uh, uh, lower sash at the frame, and then you see quite high temperatures on the sill again. That's the radiant energy coming through. But look what the image on the right shows. With a single pane clear glass, and the shade fully deployed, 
it's really resisting the, the incoming energy. But the image in the center shows what happens right after we've raised that insulated cellular shade. So we get quite high temperatures because even with single pane clear glass, we're getting a lot of energy trapped between the insulated cellular shade, which is doing its good job, and the window. We've got energy that's getting caught in between there. That's a good segue to this slide. Remember, the literature showed us that we can get, if we have a really, really good, um, particularly interior, um, or, or actually exterior, as we'll see in this slide, uh, uh, window attachment, how does that interact with a high performance, particularly low E coding of the actual window? And what the data shows here on the left hand column, this is the base case, a double pane unit with no storm, and the modeling from Windows 6, Windows 7 wasn't available at the time, for uh, NFRC summer conditions shows we've got fairly high temperatures on the glass, but even the highest one is only a temperature of 117 degrees Fahrenheit, that fourth bullet down. Now look what happens when I add a low E storm over top of a double pane unit. The ones listed in red, I'm getting temperatures inside the uh, sealed uh, insulated glazing unit, 156 degrees, the next bullet down, 185 degrees. These temperatures are high enough that we should be concerned about what those temperatures might be doing, particularly to the seal between the insulated glass unit. Now, this is modeling. You know, it has to bear relationship to what's happening in the real world. But this got our attention, and we looked at this in part because of what we had learned through the literature. And here is an interior, an interior low E storm over a double pane unit. And you can see, particularly with a combination of infrared, uh, I'm sorry, low E coatings, we're getting elevated temperatures. Now, the test to which insulated glazing unit manufacturers um, submit their insulated glazing units, there's one ASTM test where the upper temperature is 130 degrees. There's another one that's 140 degrees. Well, we're routinely in the modeling with combinations of low E storms and um, uh, double glazed units reaching temperatures significantly above the test conditions. And what we learned from the previous slide too is that in addition to the combination of high performance low E storms and high performance low E uh, double pane sashes, we also can get really elevated temperatures if we combine, combine a double pane low E with a really good insulated cellular shade. So what does this mean? What do we do about this? We have some modeling information. We also have some information from the field. In this slide, what you're looking at is the windows on the east side second floor in the master bedroom. And this is a low E storm on the outside and the sash replacement with this double pane low E. And if you look at the, the, uh, the sealant between the two panes of glass at the edge, there's no cracks and the sealant is kind of puffed up. It's kind of robust. This is the exact same setup with a low E storm on the outside and the double pane low E sash to the inside. This is on the west side. And what you can see is that the, the sealant between the two panes of glass is now convex, uh, right? It's kind of dried out. There's cracks in it. And that piece of trim that's pulled off, that's a piece of vinyl trim on the outside of the uh, frame of the wood window that the temperature got gotten high enough and you know, PVC contracts and expands quite a bit. It's just pulled the trim right off the window. So, this also caught our attention. So we have a combination of modeling information and some experience in the field that we don't quite understand what the potential is for perhaps seal failure on the IG units or maybe just uh, advanced degradation, maybe reduced service life. I want to close out this discussion of the field testing and the performance to say this. Um, we don't know that the interaction between these uh, attachments and high-performance windows is going to cause any advanced degradation or failure. What we do know is that there are conditions in the modeling and in the field 
that raise, our, uh, raise concern about how these two might interact. So we're, we're working hard to better understand this issue. Um, and I want to come back to this when we talk about the resources in just a moment. So we've gone through all of the three tasks except um, the last one, which is getting information and tools out to, to the users. So the first thing we did as we started to develop the results of our work was to create a website called windowattachments.org. And you can go to that website. The, the URL will come up again in just a minute if you didn't quite catch what I said. But we, we, we developed a website that we could use to post um, ongoing development of both information and resources um, for people to better understand how different types of retrofit options work and then helpfully to provide guidance on selection. You know, and the important thing here is that, um, you know, my wife and I have lived in this 100-year-old house for 11 years. And our way of picking window attachments or ways to change the windows, you know, putting up low east storms, putting up uh, sash replacements, buying Venetian blinds, then buying uh, uh, insulated cider shades. It, it, it's an empirical experimental process. And so we'd buy one set of attachments and say, wow, that does a pretty good job on this aspect of performance. But, you know, we don't have any privacy. We don't have any indirect lighting. In our office, there's so much glare. We need a different type of attachment. And the reason I bring that up is I think that's a lot the way, that's the way a lot of people approach window attachments. Remember, we, we buy windows or we buy a house with windows, and the first thing we do is try to change the way they work. And wouldn't it be nice if you could rationally compare all the different options and uh, not have to go through sort of iteration after iteration to change the way the windows work? Ah, there's the URL. So currently on windowattachments.org, we have downloadable fact sheets. And what we're hoping to do with our next round of funding on this project is to develop an interactive web-based tool. We also devoted a whole feature article in Environmental Building News. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Environmental Building News or not, but uh, it's a monthly publication that covers both residential and commercial green building. And um, we've been writing Environmental Building News for uh, 20 years. So it's the oldest publication on uh, building performance in the country, at least from an environmental perspective. Um, the entire feature article for June 2011 uh, is all about how to change the performance of your windows. And um, I believe that's the handout, the downloadable PDF that you can get right off the website for this webinar. Um, I want to mention that there's some fairly strong cautionary language in that article about combining high performance, low E, double paned windows with high performance attachments. And I want to amend that a little bit because we have anecdotal information and we have window modeling. What the industry has is years and years and thousands and thousands of attachments where they have not seen significant compromise of the performance of the IGU and its seals. And so the caution I think you should use is only restricted to low E high performance windows and high performance attachments. And there's some simple, and, and, and fully deploying them during the winter, no problem. Using the same window attachments to improve the performance of the window in direct sunlight on certain sides of the building in the summer, one of the ways you can get around that is simply to crack, I don't mean literally, I mean to raise or lower the attachment or the window so that there's air circulation that then dramatically, dramatically drops the heat gain that's built up between the two layers. And one of the reasons I say that is because in the November issue of Environmental Building News, uh, we had a letter to the editor of, about this very issue. And our response was to say, yeah, the cautionary language was a bit strong. We need to better understand this issue. What I hope for is that rather than the window industry and the window attachment industries being fairly passive and reactive to this issue that we can develop some proactive research to better understand what potential there is in terms of negative interaction between um, high performance attachments and high performance glazing. We've also written a series of blogs 
you know, um, the great thing about the internet is you can write relatively short articles and post them right away. And so um, there's actually a blog that's about the, uh, I'll show you that one here. Um, I wrote a blog about the, a tale of attachments, the whole process that my wife and I went through uh, modifying the performance of the windows on our house and in our home office. This slide shows uh, two uh, pages of the fact sheet. So when you go to windowsattachment.org, there's about 10 fact sheets that you can download, and they're all set up the same way. There's a general description of how the window fit retrofit option works. There's um, qualitative thermal performance information, because remember, we don't have a standardized way of testing a attachments as we do for uh, replacement windows. So we tried to be helpful, but not anything more than qualitative in, in, in terms of uh, providing information about the attachments. We hope with these fact sheets to be adding the results from our infrared uh, work. And by the way, the infrared work that is in the field is now going to be supported this fall and winter with lab testing of the window attachments. Because remember, what we want is the modeling, the laboratory testing, and the field testing to all sort of merge. That's when we know we're getting good qualitative and quantitative information to compare. We also do, you can't quite see it here, but on the second page, we always take a representative average cost of that attachment. So when you go from, um, from a window replacement to an insulated cellular shade to a film to a low east storm, you get a sense of what the representative cost differences are among these options. Now, when you do that, you're going to not only be comparing the price or the cost, you're going to be comparing all those 24 other attributes. Um, some of these attachments are adjustable, some are not. Some do a good job dealing with glare. Some don't deal with glare at all. Some can be adjusted, some can't. I mean, with adjustability comes an, an, a, a sort of a, an ability, but also a responsibility, right? Because you're not going to get the full performance out of the attachment if you don't adjust it for optimal performance. So there's a lot to consider here. And in these fact sheets, we've tried to organize the information in the same way each time so that you can do a better job of comparing um, the different attachments. I don't want to tell you how much time we spent developing this table um, because about 12 people worked on it. But we decided that one of the ways to do sort of an overview comparison of all these different window retrofit options was to put in a column on the left all, or not all, many of the different window retrofit options. And then by column, across the top to the right, uh, show most of the attributes. And then using a consumer report-like approach, um, develop uh, little, little images that allow you to pretty easily compare the different attachments in the rows with the different attributes in the columns. Um, my sympathies go out to consumer reports because if they have as much trouble developing um, the rows of quali qualitative uh, assessments as we did, it's an it's a ongoing process and it's, it's definitely an iterative one. But the, the good news is that with the researchers and with the industry representatives, this table sort of represents where we all landed. So this table is the last page of the overview, a fact sheet that you can download on the website. I encourage you to take a look at the, this first because by looking at this summary table, you can get a pretty good sense of where you might want to go to look for uh, more detailed information on each of these options. So uh, I have to show this slide. Howdy, the infrared thermographer from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, took this picture of one of our cats. And, uh, you know, he, he got to know our daughters a little bit uh, in the several times he's been out to do testing. And they said, oh, look at the beautiful picture of Ava. And uh, my older daughter, who's 13, said, and she knows I don't particularly care for cats, she said, oh, Daddy, we know that when you see the cat anytime, it always looks red to you. 
So um, such is the value of infrared images of cats. Uh, I think I've done a pretty good job of going quickly because uh, we're an hour deep into the webinar, and so that means we have a half an hour to try to deal with questions. Um, this is our office in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont. It's the original SD organ factory, uh, the largest parlor organ manufacturer in the world in the early 1900s was this, uh, uh, this uh, actually collection of buildings uh, in downtown Brattleboro. And um, you'll see the clerestory windows on the left-hand end of the building. That's where all the draftsmen for the uh, parlor organs worked. And uh, that's the most coveted space at uh, Environmental Building News offices because it's a beautiful building to work in. Um, it's also, you, most of you probably don't see very often slate-sided buildings, but uh, Vermont's got a lot of slate, so we found a lot of creative ways to use it. So thanks very much for attending the webinar, and I sure hope we have some questions because we've got plenty of time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Again, this is Andrea. And we have received some questions. We do have time for more. So if after watching the presentation you all have some additional information you would like to hear from Peter, please send me your question, and we should probably have time to get to it. Great. Uh, in the meantime, I want to... Please, uh, please answer all the poll questions um, before you leave today. We have a few people weighing in already, but we do have quite a few questions that will help us find a little bit more about our audience today. We do have a couple of viewers wondering about a copy of the slides, and we always make uh, a version, a PDF version available under the links icon, so you can download a copy of Peter's slides. And again, if you have questions, use the chat balloon to send those to me and uh, visit the links icon for additional resources that Peter mentioned today, including um, some of the stuff that he was just talking about, the resources, the downloadable fact sheets and everything. We also have an evaluation form that we would appreciate you filling out to help us refine our programs. And then if after you have viewed today's webinar, you would like to take the quiz to receive credit, we have a link to the registration form under links that you can fill out. And then if you want to review this webinar at any time, it'll be available on demand at the same link. Okay, so let's turn to some questions. Great. Okay, let me go down to some of the first ones we received. Uh, here's a question about energy cost savings formulas. Do you have any formulas that can be used to project potential cost savings estimates based on solar heat gain reduction in the summer months and or solar heat gain increase in winter? So uh, that's a good question. You know, can we transfer what we've learned uh, from the field testing or from the literature search? My, my initial answer is not yet. Um, and in part it's because the, there are two primary programs that do whole house energy modeling um, that, are, that are both DO2 as the engine and Energy Plus as the engine. And Right now, a little bit unfortunately, um, the DOE2 based whole house building modeling tools don't handle window attachments nearly as well as Energy Plus. So with Energy Plus, we're trying to constantly add more attachments so that we can compare not just solar heat gain summertime performance, but year-round performance data. The, the general rule of thumb is that any attachment on the outside of the building can do significantly better than an attachment on the inside because as I mentioned earlier it's a lot easier to keep the heat out from the outside than it is to let the energy through and then try to reject it. Now that's pretty general guidance, that's not quantitative but I, I hope I'm answering the question by saying Lawrence Berkeley National Labs is working hard to have the field testing and the lab testing reconcile with the modeling so that they can add more and more window attachments to the Energy Plus program. I do want to mention that when you go to each of the fact sheets that represent uh, some of the most common window attachments, there's a table and that table always lists the various energy modeling programs that handle that particular attachment. So unfortunately, I can't tell you off the top of my head if you go to, say, the awning attachment fact sheet, whether or not it uh, uh, runs in Energy Plus or not. 
I think it does, but I'm not positive. But that would be the first place to go to look. Okay. Moving on to another question about uh, infrared on Windows. And this viewer wonders about reflectance. Um, I mean, since IR deals with reflectance, right. um, what if it has medical, um, sorry, metal particles or a highly reflective surface? What about accuracy in that, at that point? Right. So um, the one thing that you have to, so, so there's a couple things. One is that that angle towards the shoot Make sure that the camera is not receiving feedback directly off the uh, reflective image. So that's one element of doing infrared testing on windows. The second is that um, there is an emissivity setting on the camera. And depending upon the location of the emissivity setting, you would have to change that on the camera. Now, there's only one, yeah, there's only one attachment where the low E coating is actually on the face of the window face in the room. And that's the low E film. And that actually proved to be the most difficult to test. All of the others, like the low E storm, even the interior one, the low E coating is actually on the outside surface of the interior storm. So since the camera is picking up the data off the inside surface, it, there's not as much of an issue in terms of the change of the emissivity of the attachment. Okay, great. Here's a question about, uh, actually referring to commercial buildings. I wonder mm. if you could address that. Um, from an energy savings standpoint, are window films cost effective for commercial buildings in colder climates? Yeah, so um, I didn't mention this and I should have. The goal all along for this project has been to, to address residential window attachments or retrofits um, and then in year three to move on to commercial attachments. So um, my memory serves me that uh, there is information on the performance of window films, actually even in a cold climate. There's a research paper that's available on the internet that would be in our lit review where uh, various films were tested on a, uh, an office building. I think it was in Chicago. The interesting thing about window films is that they had kind of a bad reputation because of durability issues and attachment. And the, the film industry has come a really long way um, the, so, that the, so that the performance of the films, even on the exterior of windows, is, is, is surprisingly robust or, or much better. Um, the interesting thing is that the development of a exposed low E film on the interior is relatively new. I think CP Films is the only one that has that. And the, you know, I'm not a, a window physicist, but certainly the guys from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs are. And when they first heard what the emissivity rating of the window film was, they honestly thought that that's not possible. And yet when they tested it, the low E film from CP Films was right where it was, I think it was around 0.05, which is really, really low. Um, so the answer to your question is window films are per square foot more than just a little bit inexpensive. They're, they're very inexpensive and um, their performance is steadily increasing. Now, having said that, I can back that up with qualitative information because if you put that film on a window, it becomes a window and there's an NFRC rating. So if you were to go and look at the energy performance of films, I would go ahead and look at the uh, NFRC website. And then secondly, I'm also quite sure that programs like Energy Plus can handle window films. So in addition to some of the field work that's been done and is in the literature, you can use Energy Plus to get a sense of the impact of the films as well. And this resource would have some information about payback too, right? Period of time for payback. Yeah, my under yeah, well that's a good question. Yeah. Yes, Energy Plus is a whole house modeling program that will give you feedback like that. If you go to the um, efficientwindows.org website and you look at their window selection tool and you put in your zip code and, and a bunch of other information, it will spit out uh, payback comparisons for 
a bunch of different windows. Um, I am sure that as we work cooperatively with efficientwindows.org and windowattachments.org, that there will be a place where you can eventually get a window attachment selection tool. Okay. Here's a three-part question. Um, wondering about manual J load calc modeling. Wondering if you work with that tool. Um, I've done a little bit of work with manual J, and um, from my memory, um, there's some default settings that you use for um, uh, things like window attachments, and that's certainly one of the issues because I think a lot of us when we do uh, any type of modeling or use of a tool like manual J or rem rate, um, it's, it's hard to change those settings because we either have to assume that people don't employ them or we have to assume that people do employ them and never raise and lower them. And that's one of the difficulties because will that significantly change the performance of the building? Yeah. But the question is, what do real users do? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a tough question. Mm -hmm. And here's the second part to this question. Does the awning material, vinyl or cloth, impact performance? The, uh, the type of material, I think, is much less important than the thermal and optical performance of the fabric. So for instance, that, that fixed awning that we had was mo mono monochrom monochromatic. It was all one color. That's a lot easier to understand in terms of its performance than the retractable shade on the right that had strips of green, strips of brown, strips of off-white. So yes, that does affect the performance. Um, I think the impact on performance is a lot less important than the fact that it's deployed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so there is some act impact. Right, and speaking of impact, do you expect climate zone to impact summer data, Vermont versus Las Vegas, for example? Yes. So that's a really good question, um, and I forgot to mention this, but um, NFRC uses standard conditions, and I think the angle of incident between the solar energy and the vertical window, it may even be perpendicular, or what's called normal incidence, I think. Um, and you know, the sun is, except in the west and the east, coming in at a perpendicular angle, but they, they, they've agreed on some standard conditions to use. Um, in Vermont, we did some testing in the summer in June when the sun was quite high in the sky, and then we got different uh, solar intensity when we tested in August. No big surprise. But that information was caught in the uh, um, parameter and the photometer ratio, right? Because we had sensors that were measuring. One of the reasons we did that is because even if we used um, uh, solar angle, t angle tables to try to predict what the solar intensity is, one day we might have had a little bit of a high cloud and the other day perfectly clear that's going to infect the solar intensity. So that's a kind of a long-winded way of saying, yes, there's going to be different impact in different climates. Um, on our house, we were surprised that because the windows are inset just eight inches in this uh, thick concrete wall, that, I don't know if you noticed, but in those uh, thermal images, fully the top third of the upper sash was completely in shade. That wasn't because we had any shading in effect. That was the impact of that window being inset just eight inches. Now the impact of that will change as the time wears on because as the sun lowers, there'll be less shading. But all of that is part of how the performance of the shade will change over time. Okay. This question refers to the consumer reports like chart that you showed, and I think that was your overview of uh, overview options summary table. Yes. And just wondering if you could summarize it a little bit. Don't know if you have time to do that. Um, but in lieu of that, which website has it to download? If you want oh, to remind yeah. viewers. Yeah, that, that's going to be a, I, I mean, I can try to go back to that yeah. slide. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to summarize it. Um, the fourth page of the overview fact sheet that you can download from windowattachments.org is this page. And it's cut off at the bottom because underneath this table is, there are several footnotes to these numbers. Um, we had to make some assumptions. Uh, let me try to think of an example. 
should we have, if you look all the way over on the right, that last column is security. Okay. Should there be a security difference between window films and a cellular shade? Well, when the cellular shade is down, does it provide an extra measure of security? Some would say, yeah, because you can't see in. So if there's three laptops sitting there and you walk by a window with a film on it, you're going to see all three laptops. If you walk by a window that has a fully deployed cellular shade, you won't see those laptops. Does that have an impact on security? We decided collectively that no, that was not, uh, that was an adjustable impact. It was not a significant impact. So that's not reflected in the table. Um, you know, I hold a little bit dear insulated cider shades top down, bottom up. Why is that? Well, it's because they perform surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly well, they perform well from a thermal perspective, but I can lower the top and get privacy. I can lower the top and get indirect lighting. Um, you know, th the adjustability of those and the thermal performance make it attractive. Now, is it the least expensive option? No. And I think that they're relatively attractive, but you can find an equal number of people that will say, you know, I really think the window quilts are more attractive than the cellular shades. Um, I think that there are three Fact, three attributes that, that rather consistently rise to the top. Appearance, cost, performance, um, and particularly thermal performance. Um, and so if you have a really, really good shade, but, it doesn't, but the person doesn't like the way that it looks, that's simply not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to give good information on performance. We try to good, give good information on... Uh, uh, on, on relative cost, and then we left the aesthetics up to the eye of the beholder. Great. Here's a question about storm windows. Okay. Are there any higher performing low E storm windows that are slightly vented to allow heat to escape, or would this cause too much thermal breakdown? Well, that's a good question. Um, there are a growing number of companies that are making what are called high performance storm windows. And the, there's, I think, three ways that they're different. Um, number one, they use a low E coating um, to increase the performance. Number two, they're much more airtight. And number three, the maddening thing about conventional storm windows is that the anodized aluminum gets that white dust on it, which is the oxidation. And then you throw your back out trying to raise those panels, you know, because over time, and they're not quite as sturdy. All of the newer storms are baked enamel, and uh, so the advantage there is that the, the frame construction is much more robust. Um, we have uh, Harvey Industries low E airtight storms, and they're about 12 years old now. They raise and lower with the same amount of ease they did when the day that we bought them. So here's one of the tough things, though, about quote, 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 unquote, being air, uh, airtight. Um, it's always better if the most airtight layer is to the interior. Because if the most airtight layer of a window assembly is to the exterior, then that's where the migrating moisture stops. And since that's the coldest surface, you're going to get condensation. We did not discuss condensation as part of this uh, uh, webinar today, but it's a very big issue. And it's relatively complicated. Um, I don't think we did a terribly good job. I think we have a column called condensation resistance, but we need better information on the relative condensation performance of each of these attachments. Our exterior low E storms, um, when it gets really cold, they fog and then ice up. Um, all of them have tiny little notches at the bottom with the idea that they don't want to trap too much moisture, and that's basically a weep vent. But any time that you increase the air circulation, you lose some performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Another question, why don't you do daytime field testing in the winter? And here's some thoughts on that. Is it the fact that sunlight messes up IR images? In the future, do you plan to research the benefits of winter solar gain as it interacts with heat loss? That's a really good question. Um, to get qualitative performance in the winter, we were strictly focusing on 
heat loss performance, both um, you know, conduction, radiation, and convection. Um, and if we did it during the daytime, then uh, you get all kind of kinds of crazy interference. Now, the person who asked that question may say, well, yeah, that's good interference, right? If the window is letting solar energy in during the day. Um, I think it's better to have the year-round modeling tools deal with that issue. We were strictly trying to, to narrow down the thermal performance in terms of wintertime heat loss and summertime solar heat gain. So no, we didn't, don't anticipate doing any testing. Um, and I suspect that in the laboratory testing coming up at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory out in um, the Bay Area of California, I'm not aware that they're trying, going to try to do any cold weather daytime testing. It just gets really complex. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that solar heat gain during the winter is not a really important part of the way that these wor work. Um, so for example, if I was picking a low east storm for a cold climate, I would definitely pick a high solar heat gain low east storm. It's better suited to a cold climate. The manufacturers that have developed these low E coatings for storms have been working hard on developing a low solar heat gain storm. In fact, it was in the slides. And there is testing in Atlanta, Georgia that was just completed this past summer to compare the performance in a group of, I think, 6 to 12 homes where they ran the house twelve, uh, uh, two weeks. I think it was two weeks without any storms and then two weeks with low E low solar heat gain storms. That study is in comparison to the exact same study that was done in Chicago where during the winter time they compared low E storm performance uh, two weeks on, two weeks off. The testing in Chicago was done with high solar heat gain low E because at the time we didn't have any low solar heat gain low E storms. So we're, we're getting more information about the performance of low east storms all the time, and particularly the fact that there's now are two types of them. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question has come in regarding window films. Are you aware of window films that void the existing window warranty? Am I aware of warranties that are void? Now, um, it's more typical for window films, I think, to be on single pane than not. It certainly wouldn't affect the warranty there. I think the question is more about combining low E films with uh, insulated glazing units and insulated glazing units. I'm not aware of that, but certainly either caution or uh, 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 no action should be taken if you're comparing certain film combinations with uh, insulated glazing units that already have um, uh, tintings, coatings, you know, low E performance as well. Um, I, I can't tell you exactly what those parameters would be, but um, I'm quite sure that the window, the window film manufacturers would be of great help in determining which film is applicable for which type of uh, insulated glazing unit. It's a good question. Yeah. Here's another question about concrete shading. A viewer in India uses concrete slab construction to shade windows. Is there a possibility that the conductive heat gained through these slabs minimizes the positive effects of shading? Wow. So these are shades like uh, uh, just above the window, I imagine? Uh, that's an interesting use of concrete. <laughs> um, I, I really, I, part of me says, the mat, depending upon the thickness of the concrete uh, uh, awning or shed attachment, that there probably is enough thermal mass there that it would uh, uh, shed most of that heat at night that it gained during the day. But uh, I'm, I, I will say this. I can speak with certainty that we don't have a modeling program for that yet. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, window replacement. Uh, this viewer wonders what your opinion is on that window replacement. How does that factor into this retrofit discussion today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in when we talk in the overview about um, the various approaches, uh, one of the things we say is that um, there are window attachments that can do a pretty good job of moving the performance of the, 
of the existing unit close to the performance of a, a replacement unit. So there are clear indications when you want to replace. You know, the existing windows is, can't be repaired. Um, you uh, don't like the way the windows look. You don't like the way they work. It, it, it may be a perfectly fine window, but you, they're so stuck you can't even operate them anymore. The, the guidance we give is that um, there, are, there are circumstances where the best approach is to go ahead and replace the window, either with a new unit, an insert unit, or sashes. On the other hand, there are ways that you can increase the functionality and the performance of the window without replacing it. So I don't have an inherent preference. You'll notice on my house, I did initially a new storm with the idea all along that I wanted to Im further improve the performance of the single pane by replacing it with double uh, pane low E sash replacements. Why did I choose sash replacements? because I can stain them to look really pretty much like the original sash. So in my case with a 100-year-old house, I made a whole variety of choices, but part of them were driven by aesthetics. Um, for example, we think that the baked enamel exterior storms look just fine. There are some people that would say, oh my gosh, you took a 100-year-old home and you're adulterating them with you know, storm windows? Well. The, the baked enamel painted storms look just fine to us. So um, I, I think that we tried very hard in the guidance documents to fairly compare the options and give people clear information on the pros and cons of all of the different types of attachments. I mean, one of the things about a window replacement is regardless of whether you replace the full unit, the insert, or d use sash replacements, the first thing you do when you've done that is do what? Buy an attachment. You're going to put up a shade. You're going to put up a drape. You're going to you know, put up a Venetian blind. So when you compare uh, these different options, the idea is that even the best of windows is going to require some modification for privacy reasons, for glare reasons, um, or, or even uh, interior design. So. Um, we try to give good guidance, and then people can make up their own minds. Great. Are you looking into any daylighting attachments and how that will affect either window performance or daylighting attributes? Yeah, in each of the fact sheets, daylighting is always one of the attributes that we look at. I suggest you, it's also one of the attributes in the summary table that's up on the screen right now. Um, again, you know, when I say what the sort of the common drivers of uh, Window, window retrofit selections might be. When we're talking about an office or a kitchen, you know, daylighting may be a huge attribute that's important. You may move on to a bedroom where maybe it's not. So yes, daylighting saves energy. Um, people feel better when they're in daylight as opposed to uh, uh, electric illumination. So it's a very important attribute. and. Um, you know, among the 24, I'm sure it's going to vary with people and the type of room, but uh, absolutely, that's, that's an important attribute to consider when you're comparing the pros and cons of various window attachments.